Okay, so good afternoon and welcome to this uh, webinar. I'm Hannah Vickers. I'm the Chief Exec of the Association for Consultancy and Engineering. So you're very welcome. Join us this afternoon on this. So this is a Future of Consultancy webinar, and it's the first in a series of these where we're looking at different uh, changes in the market and within ourselves as consultancy businesses, uh, looking to the future and seeing actually what's going to be impacting us. So today we're going to be focusing specifically on the construction playbook and the bit of the construction playbook we're looking at is a deep dive into the delivery models. So this obviously has um, importance to us as consultants because we will be suppliers supplying into those delivery models, but also uh, we're going to be looking a little bit about what we can what we can learn and take back to our clients where we're working as client advisors. So if you like, we've got two hats uh, while we're doing this, this webinar this afternoon. So we have done one recently on the construction playbook, uh, but this one, as I say, is very much more focused on what it means to you as a consultant. So there is a slightly different um, slant to this. I'm really pleased to introduce you to my guests I've got to speak today. So I've got Tim Chapman, who is the director of Arup, uh, he's director of Arup years, but he's also the director of infrastructure at Arup, uh, and he's based in London. So hello, Tim. Nice, thank you, nice wave. Uh, and we also have um, Ron Lang, who is the impact director at the Construction Innovation Hub, and he focuses on a project called the Value Toolkit. Hello, Ron. Okay, thank you, nice wave. Right, so I'm just going to, to move us on to some housekeeping before we kick off, because we have got quite a packed agenda today. So if you haven't joined us before, you know, maybe you're not an ACE member, but you're all very welcome. So this is an open webinar. Um, just a few things before we get started. So we are going to have, after our speakers have had their time, we're going to have a bit of a Q&A at the end. So if you want to ask questions, please pop those in the chat function um, and I will be building those to our panellists. If we don't get through them all, we will try and come back to you with those um, later on. But please do just pop them in the chat function and I will pick them up uh, for the session at the, at the end of the speakers. Please do just send them through at any point. You don't have to wait until the Q&A session. So if any of the presentations prompt a question, do add them in at that point in time. Um, and the last thing to say is that we're going to be recording this webinar and putting it up on our website. So that's as much for my speaker's benefit. No swearing, please, um, as, the, as the audience. So you will be able to watch this back and you will be able to share it with your colleagues. So please do, uh, do share this far and wide. I hope you enjoy it. OK, so I'd now like to um, just kick off with a bit of uh, sort of context and, and background. So we are looking at um, the construction playbook, which was published before Christmas, and in particular, the delivery model um, chapter that sits within that. So a lot of what we're going to talk around today, um, you'll be able to, to read when you if you download that um, download that document. I thought it was important context for us to actually get onto the same page, so to speak, around what we mean by delivery model. Um, so this is an often confused term in the industry. And actually, in this context, we've got a very clear definition here from the Cabinet Office uh, Construction Playbook, which actually defines delivery model as the optimal split of roles and responsibilities between the client and the market. So that's what we're going to be focusing on is actually um, what are the delivery models that are out there that, that, that describe that split of roles and responsibilities and how do you select the right one? So that's the focus of our, our webinar today. And I should say what it's not. So a delivery model is not a type of contract. So it's not design and build, it is not alliance. Those are contract types. What we are gonna be looking at is the um, description of what the client will do versus what the market will do. So again, sort of important, I think, learning point for, for all of us with this new terminology that's coming in um, around the construction playbook is that actually a delivery model really just describes that relationship. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to Tim Chapman and Tim is going to take us through the delivery models that are defined in the construction playbook. So the different types uh, and some of the features and the, the benefits and perhaps disbenefits of those. So Tim, over to you. Anna, thanks for the great introduction and I'm delighted to be here and delighted to actually try and explain a little bit more about this. So Chetna, next slide, please. Um, as many of you know, whoops, um, sorry, let's go back one. Um, so this is a little bit about um, uh, delivery models, as Hannah said, and how, uh, what they're about. Um, and the, the image on the slide shows um, a little known aspect of the bio tapestry, showing that these problems have been around for many thousands of years, um, and uh, the same things happen again and again. So hopefully this is a chance to try and actually bring a bit of clarity and even try and stop these things going wrong quite so often as they do. Next slide, please. Um, so this slide is top secret. It's um, current work in progress um, and sort of shows the work that we're actually doing with the value toolkit. Um, and we have a number of swim lanes going together. Um, and what I really 
I'm chuffed about this slide is it goes through the various stages. So it goes through sort of Reba or GRIP or PACE or whatever design stages you actually want to go through. It's also compatible with the Office of Government Commerce um, critical um, business case stages. Um, but we actually try and make it agnostic in terms of all of those processes and look at the things that should be happening from the client side. So as a designer, I actually like Reba. And I, I, I'm one of the few people actually probably quite appreciate the wording of GRIP, although not necessarily how it was applied. Um, but the critical thing here is we often just look upon the sort of the, the definition of the solution and not what the client, the client's team should be doing to try and make sure that the project is going for best chance of success. And especially to make sure that we're getting the best type of values. And Hannah's gonna talk a little bit more about the values and then Ron's gonna talk later on about how it all comes together. But the line I'm going to talk a little bit mainly about is the bottom one, which is called the client approach swim lane. Um, and it's, it goes through a series of stages of the client basically knowing themselves. And then as Hannah said, setting themselves up for success by deploying the team correctly. Um, so the middle phase, while the design team are optioneering and trying to make sure working out what the right solution is, um, the client is trying to work out how they might deploy the team for success. Um, and as Hannah said, people often think this is um, about um, contracts. And Emma Jane Hawkins is not with us today, uh, but Emma Jane, who's an excellent commercial director, held our feet to the fire and said, no, it's about how we deploy the team. And the wisdom of that has only really become apparent to me um, absolutely through this process. And I think um, it's a very useful uh, way forward and really, really delighted that the um, construction playbook has actually picked up on this and has included the same things that we've been working on with CIH. Um, in parallel with this, and Ron's going to talk more detail, we actually clients should be trying to work out how they control risk um, and what values they're trying to achieve and what they might be doing to choose the right values so that they actually do make sure they satisfy all their stakeholders at the end of the day. Next slide, please. So just looking at, the long, at this bit in detail, um, the first bit is trying to actually understand the client characteristics, the attributes, to come up with the client profile. So we've all worked with many types of client, uh, private, public sector. Some clients are set up specifically to create, to, to, to fulfill a project like High Speed 2 or Crossrail. Some clients um, do this as part of their everyday activities like Department for Education or any big developer or house builders. So there's a range of different clients and they each have got particular things that matter for them in terms of a particular project. And as an example, if a project is um, going to be absolutely critical to their future, it might get a higher degree of attention and risk management than if it's actually just one of many um, where they're actually providing um, uh, 100 new buildings or 25 new road schemes every year. Um, next slide, please. So the critical thing was actually on the choice of delivery models. And we came up with six main types of deli delivery models. We're recognizing um, the two first ones are actually the way we do things at the moment. We call them sort of conventional ones. The first one is the, it's what we call transactional. And it's for the situation where you know your own requirements, who can best deliver it most economically. Um, and therefore it's all about trying to just go forward um, in quite a financially controlled world. Um, and we know there's, exam there's good aspects of this, but we also know there's many bad aspects of this. And we're also very aware that the bad aspects quite often are brought to the fore by particular types of behavior. And the second example is sort of what we call hands-on leadership, which is this is complex and I want to watch over it really closely. And this is actually about stakeholder management. So High Speed 2 is in a hugely um, significant amount of stakeholders. They've obviously got Parliament um, as their critical ones who actually give financial sanction to the scheme. Uh, they've got all the communities that the railway is going to be inserted through. Um, and they've got the future communities and society that are going to depend on the railway in the future to provide low carbon travel. Um, and this is, this is a really important set of um, things to get right. We've also all seen many projects where it's gone wrong and actually many types of big infrastructure just haven't happened because the stakeholders weren't managed properly. So this needs a sort of a larger client organization if it's on top of the many more aspects of what's happening. Next slide, please, Jack now. So then we come on to um, three, what we call transformational um, delivery models. Um, the first one of which is called product mindset. The second one is called hands-off design, and the third is trusted helper. And each of these is trying to actually look at particular modern ways of building things uh, where we actually bring the particular aspects of what the client is trying to achieve to the fore. So on the product mindset, um, it's where it, it fits in with modern methods of construction or DFMA, um, and it fits in with situation where basically we're trying to productize what we're doing. So we know that sort of in a way that mobile phones have gone through quite a revolution 
Uh, we've moved on from the old Nokia, most of us moved on from the old Nokia ones and we look very dodgy at anybody who has one because they're probably a drug dealer. Um, and the critical thing is actually trying to work out um, uh, how each phone is good. And um, with each successive generation, um, everyone gets very excited when a new Apple or a new Samsung comes out. But actually those companies are planning three or four phones ahead. They're actually making sure the suppliers are working together to develop parts of the product, getting new types of battery, new types of screen, um, new types of technology. So that while we're, you might be buying the um, Apple 10, but the Apple 14 is actually for, at the forefront of the supplier's minds. And if, as an example, you're building 150 new schools for the Department of Education, um, schools should become a product. There's a right size for a sixth form class. There's a right size for a school gymnasium. It doesn't matter if you're in Huddersfield or Hull or Hammersmith. Each of them should actually be similar um, set of requirements. Um, and they shouldn't be designed each time by a new architect team coming in and trying to work everything out from scratch. So if we do these sort of things, we can make products that are far better. And actually in the process of doing so, we can actually, um, in the case of a school, um, an ordinary school might have ordinary lighting design, um, usually built for robustness in my experience. Uh, whereas actually um, the, the mood of the students, the mood of the teachers is probably very critical. Um, and you can afford to have a much better lighting designer who's going to get much better types of lighting, not necessarily more expensive lighting, but actually picks up the right aspects and possibly even can actually change the lighting during the day um, so that um, it reflects the um, outside lighting, um, which is much more in terms of natural body rhythms. So there's much better things we do with go for product mindset. Um, Hands-off design is where the client is entirely agnostic about what the solution should be. Um, and actually very often and too often in the built environment, we just actually latch on really quickly to what the, um, what the answer is and we rush to a solution. Um, and we, it's the same as what we did last time. And we all just go back and actually re-detail the same sort of thing. And actually sometimes even see, can we reuse the same drawings? And a certain amount of efficiency in that, but actually it doesn't solve the client's problems properly. And in a, in a future where we're trying to make things lower carbon and potentially more digital, um, um, we may well be not building things quite so often. We might be actually repurposing, we might be refitting. Um, we might not even build anything at all. Um, but the critical thing is the outcome. Um, and the values that are achieved in the, in the way forward. Um, an example of which we get we discussed is um, if someone was asked to build a new car park in Heathrow, but they discovered that there was a much better way of actually orientating the car parking and the flights and everything else, you might decide that you actually can do something better in terms of arrivals or in terms of flight departures or in terms of um, everything else, rather than building a stranded asset that's probably gonna have no use in 10 years time. And the third type of thing is a trusted helper. Um, it's actually the case, um, it's, it's quite like the Project 13 integrator, where the critical thing for the client is somebody really reliable who is well aware of how things are done before, especially for a high safety environment, um, and they want to make sure that um, uh, they just basically have extreme competence, um, um, knowledge of processes, and um, the example of if you're working on a live airport or on a live railway station, huge amount of um, regulations and standards about actually how you might get logistics to work, um, and those should just happen automatically. And you don't want to have to actually have the team making mistakes, potentially injuring people on the way forward and injuring passengers by making the wrong mistakes. And the final example we actually give here is what we call missed opportunity, um, failed delivery. Um, um, and there's all the cases where we as a construction industry have actually failed our clients. We failed to actually work out ways to satisfy our clients. We haven't found a way to actually make sure that they can afford the time or the money to realize their ambitions. Um, and, and actually by thinking more um, holistically and more pluralistically about what we're trying to achieve, we may find better ways of doing things. Next slide, please. And this is my final slide. Um, and as we go to the right hand side of this diagram, we actually come through and actually evolve a commercial strategy, working out once you know what your delivery model is and how you're going to deploy the team, we then go to and work out scope and packaging and how you might reward and incentivize um, and especially how we might actually develop the, the particular types of contract that Hannah was speaking about before and come up with a commercial strategy. And only then do we actually enter the procurement transaction. All too often the procurement transaction um, takes over um, and people actually, uh, and starts actually the tail wagging the dog. And we start actually being dominated by procurement rather than actually making sure procurement is doing the right thing to achieve the client's aims and ambitions. Um, and so another, I think really revolutionary side of this is making sure the procurement um, transaction is done with the right amount of information that is aimed at creating the right situation for to maximize success. Next slide, please. And this will hand over to Hannah. Hannah, over to you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Tim. So that was a really um, good overview there of the different types of delivery model that are set out in the construction playbook. And I think the takeaway 
um, to my mind, for, for everyone on the call who works uh, with the public sector clients would be, I would go away and have a good read of those delivery models and work out which ones fit with your business in terms of risk appetite, in terms of um, incentivization, in terms of what you think you do best and what um, your best clients look like. I think that will become increasingly important um, for you to have that awareness so that when the clients, even if it's not one that you're perhaps working with at the moment, if a client starts to use a particular delivery model type, for example, um, product mindset and you're an expert in that it's a way into their supply chain so that will be the uh, top tip in terms of homework from this would be to, to go and have a look think about which clients with which delivery models do you work best um, and what that looks like for your future strategy so I'm now going to switch over um, to a few slides which are aimed at those of you who work to advise clients and this can be anybody it doesn't have to be someone who is commissioned as an advisor but anybody who is going to be in a position or has the opportunity to help a client select the right delivery model so I'm just going to talk through a few slides now around um, what you need to be taking into consideration when you're trying to help the client um, select the the best delivery model so you can see um, on the left there, the there are a number of different factors. I'm going to just focus on five of those. Um, you know, this might be something for those of you that do have big advisory practices. I think this is a commercial opportunity. I think working through this um, to help clients as a facilitated exercise is actually something that's going to become very, very attractive to public sector clients. So, so there we go. That's another piece of homework for you. Um, if I could have the next slide, please, Chetna. So the Different considerations can be broken down, I think, into about broadly five um, steps. So the first one is around the value profile. Now, Ron is going to touch very much more on this later on and some of the work he's been doing, which really helps and supports clients in this journey. So the first thing, um, however you define it, um, that we need to, to work through is that is the value profile is basically what is it they actually want out of this and this is in terms of outcomes this isn't in terms of I want to build a new railway this is actually I'm trying to solve a capacity problem um, because that in itself can start to shape which delivery model you you um, you land on so to speak um, so the first thing is to actually get a feel for what they want and this covers all the wider benefits as well so this isn't just actually I want to increase capacity on this particular between these um, two particular towns it would also capture all their aspirations around I want to create a lot of apprenticeships while I'm doing that um, I'd actually like to deliver some local jobs because again all of that is really important um, to take into account when you're you know comparing what the different delivery models um, do so you know you can imagine actually if you're um, wanting to, to create a lot of apprenticeships you may, may be better off um, selecting a delivery model where you've got um, you know a sort of long-term relationship with the supply chain you've got quite a lot of supply chain invested in that so therefore they will invest in the jobs invest in those people so the first thing I think would be to, to have a look at what the client really values and compare that to, to what the delivery models um, actually um, deploy in terms of roles and responsibilities. Next slide, please, Chatna. Okay, so the next um, sort of filter, if you like, to put over those five delivery models is risk. Um, so some of them are, you know, predisposed to really help you um, mitigate uh, some of the, the simpler risks. So, for example, some of the more traditional um, delivery models, the transactional ones, deal quite well with tame risks, with simple risks. Some of the others, um, you know, where you're starting to get into a situation where you've got a really, really big sort of stakeholder complexity. Again, Tim, you know, mentioned there, um, there are other delivery models that might be better suited to that. So um, you can imagine a sort of trusted partner might be good where you've got those big safety concerns where you need to have a long established supply chain and you need to know that you've got the capability in the industry to come in and really um, almost to the same level you have as a client actually understand the environment within which you're working so so the next thing I said to, to take a look at is actually how risky is this investment how risky is this um, and therefore you know which of the delivery models um, helps us are we able to get something off the shelf for it shelf for example in product mindset or actually are we going to need something you know from our sort of established supply chain therefore we might go trusted helper so that's a sort of second lens if I could have the next slide please chat there the third one we've called um, client characteristics. So this is about trying to not sort of bend the laws of physics with your delivery model choice. Um, these are the things that you really can't change. You know, so if you are, a, for example, a pop-up client um, and you've only got a short, you know, a short project, then you're really going to struggle to aggregate enough demand to be able to go product mindset. But actually, if you're somebody like the Department for Education, you could say, we've got scope, we've got scale, we've got a long-term programme here of a lot of very similar schools. 
therefore actually you know something like product mindset is an opportunity for us we would be able to so what you can see here this is a little bit of um, how you might actually run it in practice you've got the delivery models along the top you can start to see where some of those are optimal or suboptimal against um, some of the statements coming down the, the left hand side now Ron will talk a little bit more about this because this is an extract from the the value toolkit but it was just to show you the process that you may go through um, with a client because all of these client characteristics are the immovables you know, it's sort of what have you actually got funding for? Do you care about OPEX funding? You know, how um, much of an interest does your sponsor take? Are you highly regulated? Again, all of those sort of characteristics will have a bearing on which is the right delivery model uh, choice for yourself. So, so that's what we're trying to, to point to here is, is sort of being cognizant of that um, when you're trying to help a client advise or advise a client on what their delivery model should be. Have the next slide, please, Chetna. And now we're moving into the, uh, the things that you can actually change. So these were called um, client attitudes. And this sort of picks up the sort of the kind of behavioral and cultural side of getting the delivery models to work, because it's OK having a really good blueprint of what you should be doing in terms of roles and responsibilities and what the market should be doing in terms of roles and responsibilities. But actually, if your actions and your culture and your people aren't supporting that, you're going to fail when it comes to the implementation of this. So, you know, if, for example, you are wanting to move to, to product mindset, but actually as a client, you've got a lot of internal um, staff who really want to get involved and redesign something every time, then you're really gonna struggle with that. Um, culturally, you're going to struggle to, to make that shift and have a little bit more standardization across your projects. So this starts to, to flag up things that maybe wouldn't stop you from selecting a certain delivery model, but would certainly mean that you're going into it with your eyes open to the change program that might need to exist alongside it. Um, because there will be sort of fundamental shifts in terms of the, the culture and the attitudes that, that you would need to make a certain delivery model a success. Um, you could say the same about, you know, a traditional um, delivery model when you have sort of quite adversarial commercial behaviours would be entirely different to where you would be wanting to work with a trusted helper who actually becomes a really, really sort of close ally um, to the, the client organisation. So, again, there's a little bit in here of, of learning um, and uh, just I think it's quite important that we sort of recognize this we can get very over processed shall we say um, and pick up on you know some of the the factual things and forget some of the the people and the cultural aspects of really making this work so it's just a sort of nod to that really to make sure that you pause and and consider that okay next slide please chat now so the last piece I think at that point you will have sort of put four different lenses um, on those delivery models and hopefully you will have popped out with uh, something that looks a little bit like um, this where you've got the, the five delivery models and you've got the sort of, it's very unlikely to come out completely black and white with which ones are right and which ones are wrong, but it's actually um, a little bit more, gives you a bearing on what you think is the right delivery model based on everything that you've looked at before. And this, I guess, is just a sort of um, a pointer here to say that is the point at which you need, before you make the decision, to go out and test it with the market. Um, so, you know, we see some of the most innovative clients really trying to do the right thing, um, but getting so far into the process before they actually come and consult with the market um, that you then end up with something which is a, an excellent delivery model choice, but has very low bids um, actually, you know, when it comes into the procurement transaction. So it's just a nod here to say, look, actually at this point, you may think you're almost certain, but you do need to do that piece where you're engaging with the market, both to test their appetite um, for this. So that'll be a little bit around their, you know, their risk. It may be to do with other things that are in the market, um, marketplace and the level of risk certain businesses are exposed to versus what you're putting in. So you may not have visibility of that until you actually go and, and speak to the market. And I think the second one is to sort of test the capability. So what you're trying to design here is the perfect relationship. Um, and although you may end up on paper with something that looks very good, you actually do need to put some assurance around making the mark, making sure that the market is mature enough and has the capability. It may be that you need to sort of gradually move towards a, um, a sort of more transformational delivery model than go straight from one extreme to the other because it would um, certainly um, you know be a big leap for your supply chain. So this is just a again a sort of a nod here to make sure that that at this point you go and have that conversation and you start to sort of set out and be very transparent. Um, about the factors that have led you to that, because you may well have some home truths about the attitude, for example. I quite often hear a very different picture coming from clients in terms of the, the attitudes and the behaviours that they are um, expressing uh, or believe that their organisation has versus uh, perhaps what some of the, the supply chain 
experiences on the other side of it and that goes both ways you know I can hear the the leadership of the suppliers saying well we're excellent at these sorts of behaviors and then the client saying well actually that's not our experience so there's a little bit of a sense check there on both sides to say look you know is this realistic is this the the right delivery model choice but an important step and an important sort of um, engagement to start to build the trust and to start to ultimately build this better relationship. So I'm going to um, just move on to the next slide, if we could please check. Now that was the, the end of what I was going to, to cover there. So what we've had so far is the types of delivery model, and then we've had a little bit of um, how you might select the right one, but a man who actually is sort of ahead of us in his learning, shall we say, on that, and hopefully developing uh, some really useful um, tools available to the industry is Ron Lang. So Ron, I'm going to hand over to you now, just to give us a bit of a, an insight into some work that you're doing that's not yet launched, but uh, will be will be coming out um, at some point this year. So Ron. Thanks, Anna, and a very kind introduction. Um, so those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Ron Lang, I'm Impact, Impact Director for Value for the Construction Innovation Hub. Um, as Hannah said, I'm going to try and explain how we're trying to incorporate a lot of this work that uh, the AC and their members have been leading into the value toolkit, which many of you may be aware of. So Chen, if you give me my first slide, please. So let's just kind of reset back to why uh, the, the work around the value toolkit was created. Our overarching aim with this work <clears throat> is very, very clear. How do we drive better social, environmental and economic outcomes through what we call value based decision making? And you'll have heard Hannah there talking about outcomes a lot, and Tim too. This is really about outcomes from what we deliver, how we deliver uh, as a construction sector, but also about the value and the outcomes that the assets that we leave behind deliver through their asset life cycle. Next slide, please. So just a brief nod to where this work came from. Uh, again, for those of you not, not as closely involved, um, the Construction Innovation Hub picked up this work uh, following the procuring for value work of the CLC. Um, which of course became enshrined in, in the construction sector deal of the industrial strategy. The hub as a part of the industrial strategy, as a public, publicly funded program, we're really responding to a particular part in the first place around how we can create a consistent way of looking at value as a sector. There's a general acceptance that we need to move towards value and outcomes in the way that we make decisions, but actually our view of value and our bandwidth, if you like, is very varied. So the construction sector deal set out uh, the ambition to have a, a industry-wide, a sector-wide way of looking at value. And in response, the government committed to start to embed this procure for value approach. They would start to use value as the, as the proxy for how they make decisions. Next slide, please. So I can't possibly fit on everything that's happened uh, in the time that we've been doing this work, but it, just to give you a flavor of, of, of change that's come particularly over the last six months even, um, the plethora of policy that's arriving around how to make more value-driven decisions around outcomes and social value and, and environmental value and beyond is quite overwhelming for many clients that we're dealing with. What the Value Toolkit tries to do is to create a way to trans translate that policy into action on projects and programs. So how do we take all of those different requirements that clients are being asked to look at and actually translate them into an ask for the sector and for the market to deliver on? Now, of course, we've had uh, various policy at the top there, but we've also had the refresh of the Green Book and, of course, the Construction Playbook, which we're referencing heavily today. And the Value Toolkit is referenced in there because what it tries to do is to help to deliver on the ambitions that are set out in that playbook there. And the final point, as I make on the bottom right hand side of the slide there, is that the, the value talk isn't about adding to this complex landscape. It's about how we navigate it more effectively and a bit more structured approach. Next slide, please. So uh, if we try and look at this in a sort of uh, higher level uh, fashion, what is the value talk actually? What it's trying to empower clients and policymakers to make those more informed value-based decision making uh, decisions, sorry. And as Tim showed with that uh, in progress diagram, it sets out a series of integrated activities supported by tools and guidance that help a client to make those decisions over the life cycle of a project or a program. Over the last six months, I'm really pleased to say that we've been able to engage with a massive number of people. Um, over 150 experts have been directly contributing to this work. We've also been working with Whitehall departments. We've been working with sector organizations and representative bodies. We've been working with devolved nations, and we're also starting to work more intensively with the private sector too. This is really something that's bringing the sector together to move in a direction. Next slide, please. So this is where I just want to spend a moment to try and recap on the work that Tim and Hannah have just presented and how it fits into the, the sort of ethos of the value toolkit. 
Over the six months between July and December of last year, we worked in three main core areas. So we worked in the space of value definition, which Hannah mentioned briefly there in terms of how do we help a client to more consistently and clearly articulate the things that are valuable to them and therefore what will inform their decisions. So in this, uh, in this process, we look at identifying those strategic external factors, if you like, those policies, those organizational policies, those external factors that really help us to understand where we should be turning our attention to. We then look to develop specific outcome state statements within the context of a project or program. The idea here is that there is no point in looking to policy and just reflecting that in your, in your needs and your value drivers. It's about understanding your sphere of influence within a particular project or program. So what can we actually have an impact upon? What can we actually change? And actually what's important to us within that local context, for example. We then go through a process of prioritizing and rationalizing those outcome statements. We can't have everything. We would like to have everything, of course, but this is about how we spend our money best and how we put our efforts in, uh, into creating a value profile that's balanced. So one of the examples we often give is that, of course, it's massively important we move towards net zero, but we need to understand the trade-offs we may be making in that journey. So how will the impact of, of net zero have, a, have an, inf an effect or an impact or reliance on, on labor, on skills, on sourcing of materials, for example? We have to understand those trade-offs in order to give a broad and balanced view of value. And then finally, we generate the value profile. So you may have seen that roundel image uh, that we created as a way to try and communicate to the supply chain more consistently and more clearly of what those value and decision-making drivers are going to be. The second step or the second core element of the value toolkit then says, we now have a very clear definition of what value is to a, to a client in a particular context, but how are we actually gonna go about measuring performance and how are we actually gonna go about making decisions? How do we compare different options, be they design options, tender options, or any options across the, the project lifecycle to make the most informed choice? So there's key steps in here around measurement principles. So how does a client wish to approach measurement? Are they very, very sophisticated in the way that they draw performance data from BIM models, for example? Are they more traditional in the way they wanna collect the data uh, on site? So what are the measurement principles? What access to data do they already have? Whose responsibility is it going to be to collect that data and to protect it for them? We then move on to the selection of metrics. Uh, in the early days of the value toolkit, we were really trying to bring together people together around consistent sets of metrics through engagement with clients and with the supply chain though, we found that there still needed to be flexibility in these choices. And one of the main reasons for that is that your value profile is of course very bespoke to your project. So we are no longer trying to impose a fixed scorecard on, on every project across every department and every sector of, of the industry. The value toolkit tries to help you create a bespoke scorecard for that project, for that program in the context that it is. And therefore the metrics need to be selected as, as such as well. So how do we guide the client to choose the most appropriate metrics to measure the things that are important to them? And the Value Toolkit will guide them through that step-by-step -step process. Next, we now understand what's important, how we're gonna measure it, but actually, do we understand what good looks like? And I think as we look across that value definition framework that Hannah flashed up briefly across the four capitals, we have varying um, experience and capability in, the, the, in things that we measure, and therefore we have varying capability in understanding what good looks like actually. So for each of those outcome statements that make up your value profile, we need to understand what does good look like, but also what's the range of performance that's acceptable to a client. This again, signposts to the industry uh, how they should be acting and how they should respond accordingly. And then finally, we've developed a mathematical model to help us to consider all of these things uh, in, in aggregation. So how do we look across all those value categories and all those metrics and actually inform the client about which one adds the best value based on their value profile? So finally, we now have a clear articulation of value. We have an approach or a method of how we're actually going to measure it and make decisions. But none of this matters if we don't change our approach to delivery. So a lot of what you've heard today from Hannah and from Tim is about how we help the client to change their approach to delivery, to work most effectively with the supply chain and the market to deliver the outcomes and the ambitions that they've set out in their value profile. And it can't be underestimated that the relationship between these two, three things is very important. So if you give me the next slide, please, Chenna. Uh, so it's a bit of animation there. So the, the last section there I mentioned around client and delivery models uh, and client approach is, of course, being led by ACE. So this is about, um, again, this is a less sophisticated, more conceptual version of the diagram that, that Tim and Hannah have put up. But effectively, the point we're trying to make here is that these three things, these three themes of which risk is part of client approach, really operate at the same time. The client is having this in discussions and undertaking activities in all three of these areas over the course of a project or program to try and identify or try and answer some really key questions. So at the earliest need stage, we're absolutely right. Is there even a case for change? Do we need to actually build anything? Are the outcomes we're trying to leverage going to be answered by this particular proposal? 
We then move through optioneering. Do we now have a feasible option? Do we have an option that not only is going to deliver an answer to the problem, but it is going to deliver on all those strategic um, ambitions and out outcomes too? And then we move through design, of course. Do we now have an optimized solution? Have we absolutely squeezed every bit of value and outcomes we can from that particular proposal? And are we ready to move forward with it? And of course, critically, in the longer term, can we actually measure those projects and programs and those assets to understand whether we did uh, generate the value that we ex expected? We're never going to get the data feedback loop unless we start to revisit these things in the longer term. Next slide, please. So just a final slide in terms of what you can expect from the Value Toolkit project. Uh, of course, I could have spoken for, for a couple of hours, but I don't think it would be very helpful for Hannah. Um, but in terms of where we are, we had that phase one, as I, as I mentioned, up until the new year. So we've done six months of rapid development there with a huge number of people from across the supply chain. We're currently in phase two, which leads us to a beta launch of the Value Toolkit in the end of April. Phase three then is about how we test this in a controlled manner on projects and programs. How do we start to work with uh, practitioners in the supply chain, how we start to work on clients' real projects and programs to test these tools and make sure they work and make sure they make sense and refine them, of course. And our end target is around uh, around October, late autumn of this year, we start to then hand that over to the sector. The value toolkit is something we've developed for government, for industry, for their benefit, and we want to hand it over in a way that's going to enable it to be maintained and developed over time. And of course, all of this will be done alongside the rollout of the construction playbook and the roadmap to recovery too. So Hannah, I think if I know my slides correctly, that is the end. Oh, very well done, Ron. No, that's excellent. Thank you very much. And as you say, it was a sort of little window into all of the activity and the work that, um, that you've got ongoing. But I think that's, you know, sometimes it's nice to leave things for people to ask questions about as well. So I appreciate you doing that very quickly. So a few questions. I'm going to start with an easy one. Is this going to be web, uh, webinar going to be recorded and available after the session? Yes, it will be. So there we go. That was first question solved. It will be. And I think um, we will have it sent to you in the next couple of days. So it will arrive in your inbox. OK, um, so I've got a question here for Tim. So, Tim, uh, somebody has asked, how would the construction playbook and the delivery model shift what Arup will do? It's a very bold question. So I'm just making sure I'm not on mute, making sure I don't make the critical mistake of 2021 as well as 2020. Um, how's it going to shift what we do? Um, I think it sets up projects, to, the whole project teams able to succeed far better. So there's lots of various bits about what this might be and what this isn't. And we've all seen many industry initiatives come and go. Um, but for me, this just brings a whole level of rationality to the whole process. Um, it means that people are challenged to think much more deeply about what they're trying to achieve earlier. Um, and one of the other questions actually says sort of um, uh, in terms of how we make sure that consultants aren't incentivized to accept the right model, not one's got a high fee potential. I think um, we all need to accept the fact that we're in a time of massive change. Uh, we're in a time of commoditization. Um, some people are um, going and trying to provide sort of way, very commoditized services cheaply. Some people are trying to, an awful lot of people are trying to actually provide sort of high value, high value advisory services. Um, and I think um, all consultants need to actually move, migrate their um, whole business model incredibly quickly to a much better one, which involves being much more client centric. Um, and um, this means that we need to make sure that we quickly let go of the things that will be commoditized and don't keep on trying to do them and charging fees for them. Um, and it means that we need to actually work out what the client solution is, not what, what might give us the best return. Ideally, we all will get a decent return if we run our businesses properly, either consultants or contractors, and that would be a really big change in the industry, but only for obviously very well run businesses who are providing what clients want. Um, but um, I think it's also a new entrance into the market. Um, and actually, I see the people that we don't view as direct competitors as probably much more critical for us than maybe five or seven years' time. Um, I can see software companies coming in and actually dominating a large part of what we do as well. And on one level, we might have, we, many consultants do not care if might just come resellers for software companies where the, the solution is standardized, comes out of a standard model, and all you do is actually have your logo on the bottom of the drawings that comes out and you press the button. Um, and that's not a terribly good future for all of us, but it's one that's actually very live if we don't um, move quickly. So I think what we're trying to do in the whole CIH work and the value toolkit is make sure that we set up a paradigm for success where our clients succeed more and the supply chain succeed much better. And I think this, the, the various things that we're doing, it's a number of, I think, really clever things in this. The integrated process diagram, I think, has got a huge amount of value in it. The basic value toolkit, the values that you showed Hannah earlier on, I think, show it. 
um, and the delivery models show critically about how we set up teams to succeed. You don't worry about the, con the contract comes afterwards, but who are the right people to be doing the right things at the right times to make sure the client gets what they want. Okay, thank you, Tim. There we go, a little, little glimpse there of Arab strategy, I feel. <laughs> um, okay, so Ron, I'm going to um, start with a simple one for you as well, just to kick us off. Um, somebody's asked, who will be using the toolkit? Who is it aimed at? Yeah, good question, Hannah. It always exposes where I've missed the basics, doesn't it? So the Valley Toolkit is being designed both for public sector and private sector. I would say in terms of its application, we have a mixed view at the moment. So uh, through the testing we've done so far, we have clients, uh, particularly central government clients, who wish to in-house it to some extent. Um, they will still require the input of, of consultants and advisors, but they want to really understand the process in quite a lot of detail themselves, because um, if you think about some of the delivery models around product mindset, they realize that they're actually quite repetitive in the things that they produce. We have other clients, of course, that are going to need a huge amount of help with this. So we know that the value toolkit needs to be um, delivered by somebody suitable, so a practitioner, really. Uh, it needs to be understood in great detail to be able to help a client and their teams to unlock the right answers. So in a lot of the workshops we've done, the key skill is in ensuring the right people are in the room, for example. How do you understand the mix of uh, policy and economists, for example, with actual delivery and design teams? And that mix has been really, really crucial. So to answer the question directly, it will be for, for both public and private sector. There'll be some clients who wish to do it themselves. There'll be many, many other clients, though, that are going to need quite a lot of help. OK, no, that's brilliant. So we may be that we end up sort of facilitating, but also be facilitated as part of um, in our sort of design capability. So, yes, probably something we're going to be seeing quite a lot of going forward as consultants, I should think. OK, right. So I'm going to come to some more tricky questions now. Um, so we've got a question in here about um, somebody who's interested to hear how consultants can be incentivized to accept the right model, not the one that has the highest fee proposal. So, Tim, you touched on this a little bit. Um, I'm going to come straight back to, to this uh, and give, myself, give an answer myself. I'll come to you in a second, Tim. Heads up. Um, th so the first one is, why don't you sign up to our webinar in a couple of weeks and we will be exploring this is the easy answer. Um, but just to give you a, so we actually have got a, um, a webinar one looking at what what it looks like from the consultants point of view so you know how you should be um, selecting the right um, revenue model for a particular uh, commission and the same from the client side how to select the right revenue model to get the best out of your consultants so um, so we've got two of those coming up shortly so you know go go away and look at those but just as a sort of sneak preview I think there is a you know there's a benefit here on both sides um, as you know, Tim alluded to, we don't want to become commoditized, replaced by technology, um, low value designers. So I think, you know, there is a sort of um, existential crisis, actually, um, that we need to confront here in, in terms of shifting our capability. A lot of what we do is high value, but it's not paid as high value at the moment. Um, some of what we do is lower value, but there's very little price differentiation between the two. Um, so I think that's what we need to start to, to split, if you like. And there's a number of ways we do that. You know, we can look at shifting um, you know, some of our higher value work off of hours based models onto lump sum or even performance based contracts. And, and that kind of thing would mean that we end up with a sort of financial reward. Um, but over and above that, there are, are non-financial ways for clients to be working with us. You know, you can look at incentivizing financially, but you can also look at incentivizing in terms of repeat business. So actually reward the suppliers that um, do the best job for you and deliver you the most value by making sure that they're in your supply chain long term and you have a sort of long term relationship through a framework or otherwise. So there's a number of different ways. It doesn't always come down to highest fee potential. I think it's, it's actually understanding um, what you what you value and thinking of the right incentivization and reward mechanism to get you that um, and to get the supply chain to a place where it's sustainable to keep investing and delivering that for you. So, Tim, did you want to, to comment further on that? And no, it's actually it's a very well phrased question because um, uh, the question sort of says highest fee potential. And I've always been slightly being used by the fact that a number of people seem to want to just get people sort of in a way maximize fee, maximize the size of the fee, not the size of the profit. I remember talking to a wise old contractor many years ago who um, sort of exclaimed um, that um, turnover is vanity, profit is sanity. Um, but actually, I think far too much of our industry is based on actually going for high turnover, both on the consulting and on the contracting side. Um, and um, I think if we could do something in, I don't know, a tenth of the time, but make twice the profit, that we should be really pleased with that and our clients should be really pleased with that as well. So um, I think there's many ways of trying to actually deploy teams. And again, Hannah, you've done a huge amount of work in this about how we give clients the right answer, um, but actually looking at different revenue models. But I must admit, I, I, am, I, I do remain totally surprised by the fact that a large part 
parts of our industry seem to go for turnover ahead of profit. But actually, if we can do really great things for a client, why shouldn't we get good profit? I mean, I'm not saying super normal profit, but actually just reasonable, decent commercial profit like other organizations earn for giving best value. Um, and I hope we come to an industry to provide that concentrates more on finding best value rather than bums on seats. There we go. Bold statement there, Tim. Thank you. Right. Uh, that, Rob, kind of, that kind of swearing. <laughs> not quite. Not quite. Now, I'm not going to sort of Jackie Weaver you out of the call. Don't worry. <laughs> um, Ron, I've got a question for you. Now, this is a long one to so concentrate. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so asking the question, Aaron, I'm not sure how the delivery models help increase the commercial financial headroom to meet the biggest challenges facing the industry. And they cite those as being low bidding, failing to have the commercial headroom to include things like zero carbon health and well-being. So all of the sort of wider value um, drivers that, um, that you touched on. So can, they're asking, how does, you know, how does the toolkit, how does the playbook help to actually bring forward some of those solutions uh, and reward the industry for it rather than where we are at the moment, which is low bidding? Wow, that's a tough question. Thanks, Hannah, for that one, or, or whoever it was. Um, I, think, I think there's a combination of things here. So one of the things that, one of the conversations we often have is that people feel that the work we're doing around the value toolkit, particularly around value definition, is throwing out capital costs. That we're suggesting that somehow cash doesn't matter. Well, of course it does. Um, and I think with a lot of the work we're doing with government departments, it's about the, the spending envelope they have and how they maximise the outcomes that they can get from that spend. But there has to be a tipping point. And one of the delivery models you talk through there um, recognises that sometimes your request or your, your outcomes, or your requirements aren't possible with the envelope and the spend envelope you, that you have or with the capability that you have uh, to reference your point about the market. So I would suggest that if you put those two things together, one is about how we just optimize value within the spending envelope we have, and there's still a huge amount of headroom there for me anyway. So this might be that you know, the difference between employing local people or, or people outside of the area might not make a huge difference on cost. I'm not saying it will make any difference, but still might be within your spending envelope. So I think there's that aspect. And then, like I say, being honest about what you're actually trying to achieve and whether you can achieve it with the capability and the budget that you have, I think is a step change. I don't think we're incentivized to say no as a sector. And again, that references that final delivery model that you mentioned. But it's a good question. I've probably not answered it as well as, as, well as I would like. No, no, that's great. Thank you. Tim, did you want to add anything um, to that one? Or do you, do you think Ron's covered it all? I think Ron covered it largely. I think he was uh, being unkind to himself. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. <laughs> we go brilliant thank you okay um right so i think sorry run another one for you um so there's a question here saying what level of adoption amongst client organizations in true true value-based procurement do the panel think has been or will be achieved so maybe a little bit about who you're already working with and who you're targeting with this going forward yeah again slight again slightly um on the fence answer, but I'll, I'll give it anyway. So, so the departments we're working with, the main departments across government, but also, as I said, the devolved nations and, and lots of private sector clients, I don't think the ambition to uptake is limited at all. I think the vast majority of people we're speaking to want to move towards this type of approach. However, what the value toolkit doesn't do is, is to force you to, to do anything. It doesn't say that you have to now suddenly deliver zero carbon, you have to employ local people and, and so on and so forth. It just helps you to actually recognize that you're making an informed choice. So for example, when I mentioned the metrics, um, you don't tell a client to choose the most accurate and the most uh, informative and, and whatever metrics that are gonna leave you with no performance gap. You help the client to understand what's the most useful for them, thing for them at that particular moment in time. So I think the answer to the question is the, the appetite for it is massive. I think the construction playbook has helped with that and that will bleed into the private sector as well. But I think what we'll see is a gradual increase in the effect that using the value toolkit has. So in the first instance, I think it just holds a mirror up to the decisions that clients are making. And you may find that the, the answer that they have to that is that they're happy that maybe they're not maximizing value, but at least they can see where they need to improve. But over time, you'll start to see some competition creep in too. So even within uh, between the different departments uh, within central government, you'll start to see them wanting to do better against each other, wanting to prove to uh, the taxpayer that they are maximizing uh, the, the value for money aspect. So like I say, uptake, I don't think is at all stunted, but I think we'll, we'll see a gradual increase in the level of outcomes and value that we start to leverage. And Tim, same question to yourself. Thank you, Ron. Is there, um, you know, who do you think is going to pick this up and run with it from a sort of consultancy perspective? You know, looking at your clients, who do you think they're going to go straight for this? Well, we've all been working on this the work um, over the last six to nine months alongside the writing of the construction playbook. And I think actually the fact the construction playbook came out gives a huge amount of power to what we're doing. Um, uh, so um, for those who haven't read it, I really recommend it. And I think it's actually revolutionary for the industry and it's a great step forward. 
Um, and the fact that it's um, comply or explain uh, means that actually government, parts of government and arms link bodies have to have to follow it or have a really good reason why not to. So um, uh, I, I think it's actually should be quite transformational. Um, somebody also asked one of the other questions about sort of this is we've all heard this all before and procurement never changes. We put a huge amount of effort into the early stages of projects um, uh, and the thinking that goes behind them to make sure clients actually come at this very rationally. And again, I mean, Emma Jane Horton, who's been part of the team, um, had really challenged us very heavily um, last year to sort of go through and try and work out exactly how clients would be thinking and what they should know about themselves before embarking on these sort of things. So I think a lot of the work we did start off as, with the aim of almost producing an expert system, but it, it's actually become um, probably much more um, I think valuable in this, trying to educate clients to how they do things. I've always felt a little bit um, ashamed of the fact that we insult our clients quite regularly in this industry. We somehow think we're somehow we're special um, and we need especially intelligent clients to deal with us. We just don't inform clients how to work with us properly. And I think this goes an awfully long way to making sure that we enable clients to engage in our processes and with our industry much better. And I think a lot of the value from what we're producing is about those early stages. So it's the very big tables, it's the sort of, the, it's, it's the thinking through the really critical decisions and going through all of those. Um, the clients very often accidentally bounce into projects. So what starts off as sort of a, a mild conversation at board level, you then talk to a professional and you get suddenly dragged along Reva or Grip or something and sort of um, a, 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 and into a solution rather than trying to set up the projects for success. And just echoing what Ron said, I don't think it's going to be more expensive or anything else, but actually it should significantly improve the chances of success, which includes in coming in on time and on budget, but also in terms of achieving the broader values and the outcomes that are sought. Um, and too often those get missed. We all know an awful lot of projects don't come in on time and budget, which are really, really simple basic metrics that people used to think about before. But actually, especially for public sector clients, um, bouncing in and buying something at least capital costs and actually not improving employment in the area, not having the broader outcomes that are, are, are sought, actually is really bad value, even if it, the project itself came in on time and on budget. So um, I think this is about success, not about more money. Okay, well, again, well done, Tim. Very bold statement at the end there. Right, Ron, I have a very technical question for you. So listen carefully, because I'm going to concentrate really hard on, on reading this out accurately. Uh, what level of analysis are you proposing for the value assessment? So is it a building, a system, a subsystem, or components? And how are you managing the interactions and interdependencies with these levels? And they're also asking, is the data available? I could have guessed who asked that question before I looked at it. Um, <clears throat> it's a good question. Um, so effectively, there, there's, I can even expand the question, perhaps. So this is, yes, it's about the level of, uh, of detail that you go into in making those evaluations and assessments, but also it's about the timing. So if you look across that project time, uh, very generic project stages that Tim showed, um, the level of information you have at any one time changes. So it becomes more mature as you guide through a project, of course. And um, the information you're actually after at any one time changes. So, for example, the information you require at tender stage around how the project's actually going to be delivered, how is a contractor going to actually deliver the project, who is it going to employ, uh, are very different to the questions you ask around optioneering, where you're using much different data at a different scale. So, um, to answer the question slightly more directly as well around the different levels, a good example is to look at the platform program that the, the construction innovation are also running. So uh, it would clearly make no sense for us to develop the value toolkit and not to use it to try and assess the, the potential for the platform approach for our industry. So when you look at the platform approach, you have to look at as a system, uh, does it actually start to tick some of the boxes in that value definition framework? Um, but also then that knocks down into the subsystems and into the individual projects. So uh, products, sorry. So, so the, the person who asked the question is absolutely right. This will start to filter down into the supply chain in terms of what data they need to make available. So some of the engagement we've been doing is with that longer uh, supply chain tail to say, if clients now start to ask questions around new body carbon and around employment and around where things are sourced from, that data needs to be available all the way down to those individual uh, and potentially into those source materials as well. So it will knock through that entire chain uh, that the question mentions there, but it's it's also about the timing and the different um, maturity of the data as you go through a project. Okay, thank you, Ron. Excellent. Right. Um, so we've just got a couple of questions now um, coming to the towards the end of the webinar. So there's one here around the panel's view on the current transforming public procurement green paper. So is it changed for the sake of it or is it actually going to make a difference? And what risks do you see in its implementation? Um, so I'll have a I'll first go at that one. Um, so to my mind, I mean, it's part it's definitely part of the jigsaw. Um, I think we put too much on procurement um, and the actual procurement process 
because if we if we don't know uh, what we value, if we don't if we don't get the balance of risk right, which is all defined before you get anywhere near the procurement transaction, um, you're never going to set the procurement transaction up for success. So to my mind, it, it's a small part of the jigsaw and probably smaller um, than, than we give it credit to, because it seems to get blown out of proportion, because I think as an industry, that's the bit of the client that we see. So we see the procurement transaction. We see that process um, where perhaps what perhaps is less visible to us is all of the thinking that goes on before that. Um, that actually happens and to my mind that's the bit where we can really make a difference is all the thinking that happens before you press the procurement button um, but I will defer to, to Tim then to Ron for an answer on that. Um, I think there is a whole host of government policies coming to fruition that will be quite revolutionary for our industry as we said earlier on um, and actually I, I would bring in even something like the six carbon budget which I found really exciting in terms of my pre-Christmas reading alongside the construction playbook um, because um, it sets out, I think, a large part of what the future of our industry is going to be. We tend to think in terms of sort of the prosaic things that we always, always do, like sort of office buildings and railways and whatever else. We're coming into a really exciting time for our industry. Um, and the Sixth Carbon Budget is the first global document to set out the strategy, the very detailed strategy that will help people to decarbonize. Um, um, so for those of you who know David Mackay in 20, 2008 did a brilliant book called Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air, which was, uh, was revolutionary at the time, and I think the Sixth Carbon Budget is actually a similar level of revolution. And um, we're going to have um, industry in terms of hydrogen, we're going to have industry in terms of carbon capture and storage, um, finally coming on, on source at scale. Um, uh, we, we have the actual rollout of, of hydrogen to many different types of construction, or sorry, many types of um, use of infrastructure. Um, and um, uh, we even have things like direct air capture and solar radiation management on the horizon uh, as part of, sort of in our professional lifetimes over the next 20 years will be brought to fruition. Um, a whole new industry, and again, the CCC talks about the actual employment side of things, half a million new jobs in terms of doing the various things, and even just at the very basic level, like actually insulating homes. So um, I, I think um, the, I say we all enjoy, or some of us enjoyed over Christmas reading some of these documents and actually having chance to actually read them in detail, showing what a sad gift that I am. Um, uh, but, but I think there's a whole suite of government initiatives coming together, which I think will revolutionize what happened. I think we look upon this as actually a very interesting time that set a, a, a new paradigm for how our industry will go forward. Okay, thank you, Tim. Um, Ron, I have a. Did you want to comment on that one? And I have another question, a follow-up question for you. <laughs> I will briefly comment. Um, to, really, to agree with you, Hannah. So, from my perspective, I agree. And there was a statement in one of Tim's slides. I think it said, "You know, don't blame procurement." A lot of the value has already been eroded or built in by that point. I completely agree with you. I think we need to make a better job of giving the procurement teams clarity over what they're procuring, why they're procuring it. More, more importantly, so that when changes are made or things need to be swapped out, they understand the implications of that. So, just just to echo your points on that one, I think. Okay, excellent. Um, right, so follow up question to that one, Ron. Um, how does the investment appraisal and business case development need to evolve to enable this? So, uh, I, I mean, I might defer to you, Hannah, on this one, because uh, in my my respect, we've been looking at this with, with government clients about whether we can make sure that this is aligned with our existing processes. My view is that it actually aligns quite well. What the toolkit tries to do is to help them to do what the, the business case process already asks them to do. It already aligns with the ambitions of Green Book. So, I'll see if you disagree with me, Hannah, but I don't think it's, I don't think that's where the problem is potentially. No, I don't disagree, Ron. Um, yes, and you know, I am a fan of the business case process. Um, but no, I don't think it does. I think, as you say, it helps them make better decisions as they go through that process. Um, it's about giving them more information. So, okay, I'm just going to um, go right very quickly around you as the panelists. So we've got a final, a final question, which is what's going to be different this time? And I would like uh, one line, please, Tim, uh, from you. What is going to be different this time? We have talked about this a lot before. Uh, Tim and then Ron, please. Different is huge extra clarity in the early stages to make sure the projects are set up for success. Okay, Ron? Um, I want to say the pandemic. I think it's changed. I think it's changed our outlook. I think we've taken a big hit already and, and it's the time to transform now because we've already, you know, we're already in a place where we're in the need to reset. Not quite one sentence. Apologies. No, that's fine. No, that's fine. And um, to me, um, I think this is uh, ESG um, funding and the impact of that on finance, actually. So I think this is really going to fly in the private sector when they realise you can draw a much clearer line between uh, what you want out of that particular investment um, from the financier's point of view and what gets delivered on the ground. So that's my um, top tip. Maybe it'll can, be I, can I tip. tell you that's my second answer, Hannah? <laughs> that one, Ron. You can Thank use you. it. 
take it, own it. Um, right, and that's it. So we are out of time. I just wanted to draw your attention to the upcoming webinars. I've referenced these already. So if you enjoyed this today, we've got Tim back um, next week for a sort of project speed and risk. That's really interesting and really different and probably the best lecture you will hear on risk in projects, um, I should think, this decade. So we've got Tim back next week uh, for that. And then we've got a little bit more of a sort of deep dive into pricing, the revenue models, the reward models from both the um, consultants perspective. But then we've also got Emma Jane Houghton, who is the commercial director on the 40 Hospitals programme, hopefully giving us some insight into how she's going to be getting the best from consultants when she buys uh, her 40 hospitals. So um, beyond that, we've got a bit of a, a more sort of technical session around um, the roles and the services. We've touched on disruption today, but uh, we've got Paul Tremble, who is going to be taking us through that and some of the research on that. And then finally, we've got Alistair Reisner from Seeker doing the, the mirror image for what the contractors are going to be doing in future. So hopefully uh, some interesting things to look forward to. I appreciate there's a lot of webinar fatigue around at the moment, but I think these ones are, you'll agree, worth putting in your diary. So thank you again to my panellists. Thank you to everybody who has joined us and the fantastic questions to stretch the brains of our panellists. But I, um, I look forward to seeing you in future at a, another webinar. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.